in your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is part of the unit of 8, 9, and 10, and uh, we can't get through all of even this part. Um, so we're just going to cover 13 verses, and it's, again, going to be condensed and summarized as God's revealed so much to me through these uh, passages. I pray that he'll do the same for you. Um, Paul's trying to get a message across that uh, the Corinthians uh, do have rights in Christ. They, they are set free. They can do so many things as, as new believers in Jesus, but they have to temper their rights with what is best for those that are a part of their family, their other brothers and sisters in Christ. They can't ruin their testimony just because they have a right. And, and the saying goes like this, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. A Christian who is maturing should consider those that he might affect or they might affect in exercising their rights. And uh, it's just a tremendous truth that you understand, but uh, the longer God allows you to live and walk with him, the more you understand of it, the more you allow it to transform you. And, and that's certainly what he's doing in me, and I, I pray that he'll do the same for you, that you'll want him to do the same for you. And um, in these verses that we're going to look at this morning, um, Paul is just kind of given a warning. He, uh, he, he defined the, the issue in, in chapter 8 that we do have rights, but sometimes it's best to set those aside for the sake of others. And then in chapter 9, he kind of illustrates how he set aside his right to receive compensation for the sake of the gospel and to keep from offending others so that they might hear the clear gospel without anything inhibiting them. And he moves into chapter 10, and, and again, we can't cover the whole thing this morning, but he, he uh, kind of wraps it up with a warning beginning here and then an admonition, and they're kind of all combined. And, and what God, through the Apostle Paul, is trying to achieve for this church is to get them to understand that, that this salvation is not about you. This gift of, of grace that he's given you, is, it's... You receive it, and then and it's not about you. It's always got to be about Him. It's about Christ. It's about God's love for us through the gift of His Son. And so we've, we've got to learn as sinful people who've come to Christ and received forgiveness of sin and received the gift of the Holy Spirit and are surrounded by other people who are like us, we, we've got to learn to begin to love each other the way God loves us. And that always means you set yourself at the end. You always put others ahead. And you don't cling to, to things. You cling to Jesus. And it's easy in the Corinth culture, surrounded by all the paganism and all the worldliness, all the immorality and all the worldly philosophies, for them to think that they have arrived now as Christians with this gift of salvation and they've received a truth and they've got the truth and so they're going to live it and they kind of draw a line in the sand and say this is us and this is the line and we're not going to move and Paul says you, you got to beware because when you get to that place and you think you're standing that's when the real testing is going to begin and if you're not careful that test will turn into a temptation and you will fall and give into it and then you're going to be Come bankrupt or disqualified from service, from impactfulness, from value for the kingdom from, from that point on. You, you can't get that. Listen, the call that Christ gives to all of us is to come and follow after me. That implies a progression. That implies movement. That implies growing. That implies that he's going to find us where we're at and move us to where he wants us to be. And that's, that's the consistent throughout all Scripture, is that we never come to a point as Christians where we go, okay, now I've arrived, and I can just camp out here. That, he says in a moment, we'll see, beware lest you think you stand. That's when you're most vulnerable to fall. That's indeed what the Corinthians had done. We have done the same thing in many ways, and Another thing I just want to address before we get to the passage is God loves us in Christ, amen? God says, those whom I love I chasten because I want them to be obedient, not just 
when they receive my son as Lord and Savior, but as they grow and move through their life and growing in faith and pursuing me, I, I want them to be in obedience, and when they're not, I'm going to discipline them. And in that case, when they don't, I'm going to chasten them, not to condemn them with the world, Paul says later, but, but to condemn them, to, I mean, to chasten them, to, to grow them. James talks about these trials that come upon us that are our tests that mature us and that help us grow more like Christ. So God's going to use those things to, 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 to help mold us. And just as he does that to us individually, so he does that to us as a people, a body of believers, or a nation of believers. And the examples in Scripture are Israel, his own people, a whole nation of people. And, and because they, they were willing to follow him so far, but then they drew the line, he had to bring discipline. And in their case, it was condemnation. And we're going to see what he says there. And so we know, and the men are studying through the scriptures. We've covered Isaiah. We're in the, the prophet Jeremiah right now. And we see that God will judge a whole nation of people because of individuals' sins. And when enough individuals sin in such a way that... that it's, it's at a certain level, then God says, okay, I'm not just going to deal with you individually. I'm going to deal with you as a group, as a, as a body of believers. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring about some strong discipline to rescue you. And that still is an act of grace. And, and today we have to understand in 2016, if we are a group of believers, a body of individuals that he has put together to form his church, then he's not going to let us escape that same thing. He's going to, again, be faithful to those who are his. And when it comes to that point, if it ever does, then he's not going not to, as a righteous, holy judge, he's not going to say, well, I'll, I'll let you slide this time. He, he has to, because he is God, bring about judgment or chastening to this body. What God has revealed to me is that the sins of the individuals build to a point where God says, okay, that's enough. I'm going to have to judge you as a whole. And what I've prayed and understood is that, Lord, I, I'm a sinner, and I don't want to be. And when I sin, convict me so that I'll change. But, Lord, let it not be me who acts in such a sinful and selfish way that is... Uh, figuratively speaking, the straw that broke the camel's back, that it's my sin, it's, it's me, the reason that you have to bring judgment upon us as a group of people. I think you would have the same heart. I, I don't want it to be me. And so Paul, addressing this church in Corinth, says, listen, take heed to this. I've told you that you do have rights and liberties, but you need to set them aside sometimes for the sake of the gospel, for the benefit of your fellow man or your fellow uh, uh, Sister, your, your brothers and sisters, you, you have to sometimes set them aside. Just because you have them don't mean you need to exercise them. Here's how I've set mine aside, and he gives that illustration. Now he says, but beware. And this is what he says. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. There's a testimony in the New Testament that Christ was alive and well and involved with his people in the Old Testament. That rock was Christ. But with most of them... God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things have become our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and that we do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did in and, and one day. 23,000 died. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them as examples. 
and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, I thank you for how you reveal yourself through the truth of your word. I thank you how you use that truth to transform my life and help me understand better how I can live in a more effective way for your gospel's sake, for your name's sake, for the sake of your people. And I pray that as you've been working in me, that you'll work on these precious people who are here today, that you love and through Christ you want to you bless in such a tremendous way. Let us all receive what you have for us today and know that we're all individually accountable to you for what we have received so be pleased with our receiving it and help us to live it out that it may continue to affect others for your glory give us ears to hear this morning father in jesus name i pray amen so paul says listen i I want you to just uh, listen to to Something that you should know, and these folks, many of them should know it. They had been Christians for several years. Paul started the church and spent a year and a half there. Apollos came in afterwards. Peter had either written letters to them or had come by. So they had some tremendous teaching, and they had these great truths given to them. And so he says, I just, I just want you to be reminded of these things. Look in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. Don't, don't forget that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate that same spiritual food and they all drank the same spiritual drink and he tells us what that was, it was Jesus. And all he's saying is, listen, I, I, I don't want you to forget, we've told you the story of the Jewish people, how in, in Egypt God had brought them there through Jacob and through, through their uh, deliverance to Egypt they became slaves. And for over 400 years, they prayed for deliverance. And God, when he decided it was time, he sent forth a leader, Moses, that he chose to to be the one to go and and minister to these people and bring them out. Don't forget, he says, that all our fathers, they were under the cloud. And he's referring to the pillar of cloud that followed, that led them in the daytime, the pillar of fire that led them at night when they came out through the exodus. They were all experiencing that. And it says... They, they all were in the cloud and they all passed through the sea. The, the whole nation, two, two million, upwards to two million. Slaves, Israelites in Egypt, they all came through and they passed through the Red Sea. God split the Red Sea. You remember that story? Say amen. And they passed through on dry ground. They walked right through. They, they all were, were experiencing the, the, the pillar of cloud. They all went through the Red Sea. And, and further it says... Uh, they were all baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. Moses came and God brought him to be the deliverer, the leader of this great people to take them where God wanted them to be. He met them where they're at. And, and so it was Moses, it was the cloud, the presence of God. It was the sea, the power of God. And they all ate the spiritual food. Think about that. Two million people out in the desert. What are they going to eat? God said, you know what, I'm going to give you angels food. Krispy Kreme donuts every day manna from heaven they will wake up because they're like what are we going to eat God said hey I'll, I'll provide I'll, if God gives you something you know it's going to be the best I'm going to give you something that's going to meet every nu- nu- nutritious need you have and it's going to make your taste buds happy and every day they got up and they gathered the manna that just appeared there with the dew and they gathered enough for the day and, and they took it and it was sustenance for their, their physical being they all participated in that they all ate that they all had water. Where do you get water in the desert for two million people? God provided it. Go to the rock. Strike the rock. Speak to the rock. Out of the rock, I'm going to bring forth water that's going to meet your, your physical need. How much water does it take to, to take care of two million people? Think about that on a daily basis. They all experienced that. They saw the power of God. They saw the, the, the provision of God. They, they, they saw the presence of God through the miracles in Egypt and through the splitting of the Red Sea. He says, they, these guys were blessed. 
Christ was there leading them, bringing out from them a people that were going to be zealous for him. And, and, and they were tremendously blessed. Think of what they had received. For over 400 years, their forefathers had been praying, Lord, we need deliverance. We need deliverance. We're your people. And here we are in Egypt, and we need to be rescued and, and taken out of this bondage. And in the proper time, God sent a leader to say, Hey, God sent me to, to take you out of here. Who are you? I'm nobody. But I serve the God you've been praying to, and he's told me to come and, and take you from where you're at to where he wants you to be. How do we know? Well, let me show you. God performed ten plagues to the point where the people of Egypt who were resistant at first, at, by the time the last plague came, the death of the firstborn, they said, here, get out and take all of our jewels with you. Get out. We don't want this God of yours hurting us anymore just go and, and take your God with you we, we can't handle that and so it was pretty clear until they got to the Red Sea and then they said Moses what is wrong with you I thought God was delivering us now we're, we can't go through the sea it's too big and, and here comes Pharaoh and his army we're going to perish and God through Moses said be still and know that I'm God and watch and the sea split and they all came through two million and then they turned and looked, and they saw the ocean swallow up Pharaoh and his army. Wow, and they sang that song. If you can go back and read that, oh, incredible. God is with us. God is with us. Man, they were blessed. They got to eat manna from heaven every day. They got to drink the water that only God could provide. They, they were, all their needs were met. And they were not in bondage anymore. And on top of that, they're not just out of Egypt out of bondage but God had a destination for them follow me and I will take you somewhere you know we talked in Sunday school this morning God met a man named Abraham and said hey come and follow me leave all that's comfortable to you all your family all everything that's familiar to you have enough faith to follow me and I'm going to take you to a place I'll show you later he didn't know where he was going same thing's happening here. Here comes Moses. Hey, I've chosen a leader to, to represent me before you and the Pharaoh, and, and I want you to follow him. I'm going to guide you from where you're at to a place I want to take you, a, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place of blessedness where you're going to be able to establish your lives and get to know me better. They were blessed, amen? How blessed are we? We've been delivered from sin, those of us who are Christians. We've been given the gift of eternal life. We've been given the presence of the Holy Spirit. We've been given the Word of God to direct us. We've been given the people of God to surround us. We live in a nation, the greatest on the earth. Amen? How blessed are we? So, like Paul's telling the Corinthians, God today is telling us, listen, these, these things were written down as an example. Don't fall into the same traps they fell into. Don't make the same errors they made. Don't get to a point where you think you can, you, you, you've arrived and you get to tell God how you're going to want it to be. They didn't say, Lord, we want you to deliver us. Send Moses and come perform ten plagues. Take us through the Red Sea and get us into the land. They, they just said, Lord, deliver us. And he said, okay, I'll do it. Here's how I'm going to do it. And they said, we don't like this. Look, look at what the Bible says. They all drank that spiritual drink. It was Christ. Look in verse 5. Here's the testimony of Scripture. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the desert. They were strewn. God was so displeased with them, he killed them off in the desert one by one until he could raise up a new people. That's how displeased he was. The writer of Hebrews says they had a faith, but they didn't have a saving faith. And so God let them die out in the desert. Because they drew a line in the sand. You mean how, how did they do that? Look what it says. God wasn't pleased with them. Most of them he was not well pleased. <clears throat> Verse 6. Now these things became our example. This, this history of the Israelites became our example today in, in this last age in which we live, this church age. It's, it's written down for our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Wait a minute. These people were in Egypt, a pagan, corrupt society, a, a false worship, many gods, and, and they were still praying faithfully to Jehovah God, their God, the God of their fathers, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, and, and God came and rescued them. How did they continue to lust? He, he lays it out here. Look what he says. 
Let, let's not follow this example then and continue to lust after evil things, worldliness, old ways. And do not become idolaters as they were, uh, as, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play let us let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell do you remember the story it, it, it's it, it's recorded in the scriptures in, in numbers and in exodus and and there's a story in exodus where the people get to the mount uh, sinai and they're at the base moses goes up to commune with god and get more instructions and, and the people get weary from waiting on moses and they want to worship god they truly want to worship god but but they haven't been told he, he's, he has a prescription for worship but they they reach back in their past in their in their days of egypt and they say we got to have an image so let's worship the one true god our way let's make an image and we will we will commit a great uh, sin. We, we're going we're gonna to celebrate the way that we know from the past. They wanted to worship God, but they didn't know how, and so they just did it the way they thought they should, which was wrong. They, they gave all the earrings to Aaron, remember, and he fashioned this calf, and they came and they bowed down to the calf, and they ate and they drank, and they had this big to-do of sexual immorality because that's that was in their past and they thought we can just worship this new god in our old ways and god did not accept it god has a prescribed method for worship and he lays it out and when you worship the wrong way there's consequences what happened here how many died Thirty-two thousand. Twenty-three thousand. i got it reversed a little dyslexia Twenty-three thousand died moses get down from here the people have committed a horrible atrocity Go down there. Do y'all remember? Go and read that story. It is incredible. Over in uh, another place called Shittim, they did a similar thing, and 24,000 died there. It, it's, God doesn't accept false worship, even if you're trying to worship the true God. And I've shared with this before. There's still Jews today who are trying to, to please God in Judaism. He's not going to accept them in Judaism. He's going to accept them in Christ. And if they don't come in Christ, they're not going to be accepted. So God says, hey, uh, look at these examples. This is what they did. Paul says, don't do what they did. Don't, don't, don't fall into this idolatry, trying to worship God the way that you want to worship God. Worship God properly the way he tells you to. Look in the next verse. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Over in Numbers 21, you read about the fiery serpents. Why did they come? Because the people who had been delivered by God, who experienced God's power and were experiencing God's provision and experiencing God's protection, got to complaining about what God was giving them. They got to a place where they thought they could stand and say, You know what, God? We don't like what you're giving us. We want what we want the way we want it. Sound familiar? Amen? Or oh me? We want some meat. We miss the onions and the fish and all that stuff. We want some meat. And God said, you're not happy with what I'm giving you? I'm giving you perfect stuff. And you want that old stuff? I'll tell you what. Let me show you how good that old stuff is. He brought all those quail in there. Y'all remember what happened? Here's you some meat. And buddy, they got happy and they started eating. And the Bible says while they were still chewing it up, they began vomiting out of their nostrils. They were testing God. Why, why do we have to put up with what you've given us? Why can't we have what we want? Because you, you don't know what's good for you. You ever told your kids that? That's where that comes from. And so God said, man, I'm providing the best for you, but you don't want the best. You want that old nasty stuff? I'll give it to you, but it, look what happened. And, and many, many people, don't say how many there, but many people died. Look in verse 11, or verse 10. Nor complain. It's interesting to me. That, that complaining is, is mixed in in idolatry and tempting Christ. Complaining. S someone said when we were talking about spiritual gifts, so I know what mine is, Pastor, mine's the gift of complaining. It's not a spiritual gift. It's not a spiritual gift. And, and it's kind of funny, and we have to make light. I'm a complainer. Are you a complainer? God help us. Look, look what he says about a people who complain. He said, uh, uh, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, that just simply refers to the angel of death, the same angel that came through uh, at the last, last plague, the, the plague of the firstborn that was killed. Uh, later on, David, who uh, 
counted the people. He did this censor thing, and he, and he counted the people, and the destroyer came and started killing people. That, that's all he's referring to. But, but the story that he's talking about here is, is uh, the, the, the people had assigned roles, kind of like the church. You know, we all have a role to play. But some of the people got unhappy with their role, and they weren't so much unhappy with their role. They just didn't like Moses, the leader, and the role he had. Remember the story of Korah? You can go and you can read about Korah. It's in Numbers 16. And so Korah, because he was not content being in his role, and he certainly wasn't content with Moses and Aaron calling the shots, he, he confronted him, and he talked 250 people into confronting the leadership that God had appointed them and said, who died and made you boss? And Moses said, dude, I'm just fulfilling my role. God called me. I was just a shepherd. He said, come, and he's demonstrated his power, and I've shared the truth, and I've led you the direction he wants me to go. Why are you mad at me? Because I don't like you being boss over me. We all have equal standing before God. And Moses said, yeah, you do. But I, I guess just do this, Corey. You and, and Dathan and uh, Abiram, y'all come with your censors, and we'll all appear before God, and we'll let him, we'll let him decide who, who's supposed to lead. You remember the story? So they came, and they appeared before the Lord. And Moses had said, Lord, if I'm wrong, then don't do anything to these men. Let them just die naturally like everybody else. But, but if I'm right and, and these, thing, these people, when, when they're confronting me, are really confronting you, then do some new thing and let the ground open up or something and swallow them so that everybody will know. So they all appeared and they got there ready to worship. God said, step back just a little bit, Moses. And they stepped back and, and, Mo, and, and, and Korah and, and Dathan and, and, and Abiram and their families all stood there saying, all right, God, who are you going to accept? And you know what happened? The earth, God caused it to open up, and it swallowed up them and their whole families. Boom. And then they worshiped God, said, thank you, we're sorry, we hate that, but we just want to be obedient. So they went home, and, and that's not the care. You would think that that would send a message throughout all the camp. God's made it clear who's supposed to be leading us. Let's not fight against God by fighting against his leadership let's accept it and fulfill our role and let him fulfill his role he'll answer to God for his role but you know what the Bible says the next day they, they, they all got together and they got mad and they came to Moses and Aaron and said it's your fault these people ain't with us no more it's because of your actions those folks are gone and they're not with us anymore and God said Moses stand back again and he wiped out 14,700 people Nathan and Korah and, and Abiram got swallowed up. The others that were with them, 250 other men, they took off running. The fire of God came out and shot them down. The next day, everybody was mad because, because God acted. Don't be complainers. Do you think that if God acted this way with his own special people that he's going to let us escape who are his special people in Christ? What Paul is saying, take heed, you Corinthians. Listen, you, you think you've arrived and you've got these things set in your mind the way that those people did. Look what happened to them. Don't let it happen to you. Because of your blessing, because of what you've received, because of, of the, the, the longevity of walking, you, you think you've arrived and you've got this concept of how things ought to be. Don't start dictating to God how you think it ought to be. You better just be thankful to receive what he has for you. Don't cling to those old things in your old life or the old ways. Be ready to receive what God has for you. He wants to move you from where you're at to where he wants you to be. Faith is progressive. It's always moving. It's always active. There's never a time when faith is sitting still. You're always to be growing. You're always to be shaped into the image of Christ. You have to be moving forward, trusting, exercising faith, and letting go of the old things to receive the new things God has for you. Do you not think he has new things for you? He does. So Corinthians don't do this. Now look what he says in verse 11. Now all these things happen to them as examples, and they're written down for our admonition. That means that when you study that word, it means that so that you can learn and be benefited from what happened to them, so that you can take heed and, and, and be benefited from what you've read about them. This, that's what it's there for, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We're in this last era, and certainly we have gathered so much more information. God's revealed so much more to us today than they ever knew. So now 
look back and read their, their examples and don't follow those bad examples. Follow the good ones. Don't follow the bad ones. Learn from them. Be admonished by that. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, you Corinthians. And remember earlier in the chapter, uh, in the book, he, he said, yeah, oh, you're, you're so full. You've got it all figured out. You're so full of knowledge. You're so full of information. And you have all the truth figured out. He was really being so sarcastic because they were living in such an ungodly way. He's saying, be careful. You think you're standing because you think you got it all figured out. Worship is supposed to be this way. And, and God's going to do this for us. And God will work in this way. And, and this is how he worked in the past. And this is the way he's got to work now. This is the way we always have it done. This is the way it's always going to be. This is the truth we received when we were seven. And so that's got to still be the truth today. And, and he's saying, listen. Truth is not some mystical concept. Truth is a person. Amen? And the longer you spend with a person, the more you get to know that person. Amen? And if truth is a person, that person is Jesus, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Then understand, what he revealed to you when you were seven was good. But he's going to reveal more of himself now that you're older than seven. Amen? The longer you spend time with him. So, the way you worshipped when you were seven was acceptable. The way you prayed when you were seven, it was good. God is good. God is great. Let's thank him for the food on our plate. That, that was sweet. and That was good. But now you're not seven anymore, see? So you've got to grow and you've got to learn and he's going to reveal more of himself. The longer you're with him, the longer you walk with him, the more you're going to know, the more you're going to understand, the deeper the truths are going to get. That's what God wants. Take heed lest you fall. And then he puts this in here and it seems kind of weird and, and this verse will preach for about six weeks. Lord help us that maybe one day we'll get there. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful. He's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he'll make a way of escape so that you can bear it. And it's the way of escape. And, and it's interesting. I've got to cover this. And, man, I want to just wrap it up right now. But I've got to cover The temptation, and we can talk about it another time. It's a two-edged sword. The temptation here is, is God's not going to tempt you to evil, but God will test you to improve you and to grow you and to strengthen you. That's what, Paul, what, what James talks about, right? Those trials are going to strengthen you. But, but listen and understand this just for a minute, okay? We've got to cover this and then we'll, I'll move on. The, the test God puts before you is external. You step into a circumstances. Here's, here's an, a situation that is, that is you, you've got to be careful. God wants you to to excel through it and, and go through it the way he has prescribed to you. The, there's this temptation, this, this test to strengthen you. It's external. And, and when you go through it, if you pass it, then you're strengthened. But when you're in that external thing, this test, this, this opportunity to sin, to take money that's not yours, to, uh, to step out of your covenant relationship with another, okay, in an in immoral way... To, to tell a lie. Here's an opportunity. You've been put in this external situation where you've got to speak the truth and all this pressure's on you. Or are you going to speak the truth and let the truth set you free or you're going to cave into the fear of people and you're going to kind of tell, tell a little white lie. The, when you take that external test and you begin internalizing it and you begin contemplating it, that's when temptation comes. And it's still not a sin, but this thing happens in you that says, well, I could take some of that money because I could use it. I know I'm supposed to give it all back to whoever it belongs to. It's not mine, but, and I'm not supposed to steal, but I could use some of that money. Um, no one's going to know if I step out of my covenant relationship with my spouse and, and kind of enjoy a little bit over here with someone else. I mean, it, I don't want to, like, forsake my spouse, but there, here's an opportunity, and I have needs, and, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's not going to hurt anybody, and it's not going to mean anything. I, I, can, I, I could tell just a little white life for the benefit of these people because if I tell them the truth, it might just destroy them, and so I, I don't know what to, I could, uh, I could kind of say it this way so that it's not, you know, it's not a total lie, but it's just not the whole truth. I, that's the temptation. And when the temptation comes, the Bible says that, that your, your desires are being provoked. James talks about this in James chapter 1. He says, blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life with which the Lord has promised to those who love him. But let no one say when he's tempted, he's tempted by God. God does not tempt people. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted, listen, 
Each person is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires or his own lust. See, this thing that I need a little more money, my own, my own desire, my lust in me. says, I need a little bit of that money. I, don't, I could give some of it back or, or I could keep it all. No one would know. This, this desire in me, this lust in me, I'm drawn away by that. God's brought me a test, but I've contemplated it and began thinking about using it for some other reasons. And, and so those desires in me come out. And James says, you're enticed, you're, you're lured away by your own desires. And then when desire has conceived, when it, when it talks you into doing that thing, then it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth separation or death. See, so, so understand the whole context of this in chapter 10, these first 13, hours, the 13 verses. God is, is saying through Paul to these Corinthians, listen, God's blessed you with so much. And just because you're blessed with so much and you've experienced the power and provision and protection of God, don't think now that you get to turn and tell Him what you want, when you want it, how you want it. You're still the one that you've been, that's been redeemed. You're still the one that's in need of saving. You're still the one who's cried out for Him. And He is, by His grace, working on your behalf. Don't upsurp His authority by saying, this is the way it's going to be. Take heed lest you fall. And, and it's... He, he says that because some people say, well, you know, I entered into this temptation. It was just so powerful. I couldn't resist it. No, you haven't experienced any temptation that's not common to man. Temptation, in fact, is human. It's only human. It's not demonic. Satan has no power, okay, to overpower you. God's faithful and just. He's not going to allow you to be overpowered. This is just a human thing. It's common to me. People come and say, Pastor, I need to talk to you, but I can't tell you what I've done because it's just so horrible. No one's ever done this. That's the most selfish thing. We think we're so special that we have some sin that no one else has committed. The Bible says nothing's new under the sin. The pride of life, the pride of the eyes, and, or the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and lust of the flesh, that's it. It can't fall into any other category. Jesus endured all temptation in the flesh, right, as a man, so that he could be our empathizer and our sympathizer, our great high priest, so he'd know what we went through, yet he did it without sin, without giving in to temptation. So, so it's just human nature to be tempted because we have these lusts, this sinfulness that, that appeals to us and, and lures us to go against what we know God has given us as Christians. So that's why he does that. Take heed lest you stand. Now, he applies that to them, and he goes through the rest of the verse. Let me apply it to us today. There's a little story that I've told to you many times, and it just so, so fits this. So just bear with me. This little girl, precious little girl, about six years old, went to the uh, shopping with her mom, and she went to the five and dime store. Y'all don't know what that is, so let me just say she went to the dollar store, okay? She went to the dollar store, and, and she had saved up some of her little money, and, and she went to the toy aisle while her mom was picking up a couple of things, and, and there it was. She saw it, and it was beautiful. It was a a pearl necklace, only it was plastic, okay? It was just a cheap little toy. A pearl necklace, just like she thought, just like mommy's that daddy got for her. Daddy got her this beautiful pearl necklace, and she always wondered. And she saw it, and she said, Mommy, do I have enough money? And mom said, well, you, you almost, I'll, I'll help you get it because you seem so excited. Oh, I want to, I'll take good care of it, mom. I'll take, you have a case for your pearls, and I'll make a case for mine, and I'll, I'll take good care of my pearls if, if you'll just help me get them. And so mommy helped her get her. She put them on in the car. She was so proud. Dad came home that night, and she, she walked in, and she said, look, Dad, my pearls. Aren't you proud of my pearls? Don't they make me look pretty? Oh, they do, sweetheart. Those are special. Those are awesome. Where did you get them? She told her the whole story. So got ready for bed that night. And the dad had talked to the mom, and she said, Man, she is just, oh, so excited about these pearls. I mean, this is the thing that she loves more than anything in life. And the dad thought at first, that's pretty, pretty special. But then he thought, wait a minute. She can't love those pearls more than anything else in life. So he got to thinking, I would love to give her some real pearls this is my daughter I want to give her the best but I can't let her get so she's attached to these plastic ones what's she going to do with the real ones so he went in to tuck her in that night and she was still just a beam and she said look daddy and beside her bed she had got a, a shoe box and she put some some material in there it wasn't velvet it's was kind of like that and she laid her pearls and said look I'm taking care of my pearls just like mommy did and he said you really love those pearls oh dad I'm so in love with those pearls he said, that's great, sweetheart. You know, Daddy loves you. Oh, Daddy, I know you love me. You know, I always want you to have the best, yeah. And, and then he said this, do you, do you love me more than those pearls? Oh, I do, Daddy. I love you more than those pearls. And then he said, well, would you give Daddy your pearls? 
oh, Daddy, I, I do love you, but I can't give you my pearls. So he just kind of smiled and he gave her a kiss and he left. The next day, she was all about those pearls again, went through the day, and she paraded around. She took good care of them, put them back in her box. Night came, Dad came back in, and, and what she didn't know uh, that he talked to Mom about is, is he picked up some pearls for his daughter. Six-year-old daughter bought these expensive pearls, real pearls, and he wanted to give them to her. And so he came into her room that night and he said, Listen, you know, I always want you to have the best, and, and I love you more than anything. Do you love me? Oh, Daddy, I love you. Do you love me more than your pearls? Oh, yes, Daddy, you know, I love you. You always take good care of me. You always give me the best. I love you more than pearls. Well, would you give Daddy your pearls? Oh, Daddy, I, I love you, but I can't give you my pearls. He said, Okay, so he kissed her, and he just put the new pearls in his pocket, and he went to bed. And this went on for several days until one night he came in to tuck her in. And, and when he opened the door and looked at her, she was sitting there with the pearls in her hand. They weren't in the box like always. And she was crying. And he said, oh, sweetheart. And he sat down on the bed and he said, what's the matter? And she was crying, a little six-year-old tears. And she said, Daddy, you've been asking me if I love you. And I do. I love you more than anything. You're my daddy. You care for me and you provide for me. And you always give me the best. And I do love you. But every night you ask me to give me your pearls. And, and I... I haven't given you my pearls because I understand now I've been loving my pearls more than you. I'm so sorry, Daddy. I want you to have my pearls. I love you more than I love my pearls. And he said, sweetheart, that's, that's so, and he was even crying, that, that's so special that you, you've understood that the pearls can't do anything for you. They can't even love you in return, but Daddy's always going to love you, and I'm always going to give you the best. And all of these last few days, here's why I've asked you for those pearls. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out the brand new ones. I needed those old ones so I could give you the new ones. You had to let go of what was so special to you so I could give you what was really of value. I could give you what is going to be a true treasure to you. And she just, her tears turned, oh, Daddy, thank you. But, Daddy, these pearls are wonderful and valuable, but they're not you. So if you ever want these real pearls, I'm going to give them to you when you ask. Now listen to me, church. I'm not a, a preacher on the radio that preaches in generalities. I'm your pastor, and I'm speaking to you as your pastor, as someone who's learned this lesson firsthand. God has things he wants to do for us as his church. God has new truths he wants us to cling to and accept. God wants to do new ministries through us. He wants to use us to impact some void in, in a new way. But we've got to turn loose of those old things, of our old ways of the old truths that we learned and they weren't bad truths but they were just some things that we learned we've got to grow into those new things we've got to let go of that old way the old life so that we can experience the new life as individuals and as a church listen the old ways of doing things how the church has practiced for the last 150 years are wonderful but God's not going to lead us into a new way until we let go of the old way. Our way is not his way. He is the way, the truth and life. He is the way, right? We've got to love him more than our old ways. Our truths that we've carried on as Southern Baptists for so long and as the First Baptist Church of Oregon are wonderful truths, but there's more depth and there's more meaning to those truths. And our truths aren't him. He is the way and he is the truth. And we've got to love him more than those things we're clinging to. And the old life that we've always lived, as Christians even, it's not Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We've got to love Him more than our old life. And when we're willing to let go of those things, He's going to bless us with what He's had waiting for us. The children of Israel left their old way. They left their old truths. They left their old life. And He said, hey, I have a new way, a new truth, and a new life. It's in this place. And they said, yeah, but we're going to draw the line in the sand. And they paid the ultimate price. Don't let us do the same thing. You don't do the same thing. Don't let us as a church do the same thing. I don't want me to be the reason why we miss out. I pray that you don't want you to be the reason we miss out. Let's pray together.